Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to my shop. It's another Wednesday. It's another Renaissance Woodworker Live. Today we're talking about bevel up versus bevel down hand planes. I don't even like to put it that way because it sounds very adversarial. I want to talk, I, I've certainly talked about this in the past. I did a video, good Lord, maybe eight years ago, seven years ago, called the bevel up versus bevel down hand plane debate. Um, I've also touched on this in the hand tool school a couple times because my opinions, my philosophies have changed slightly. I'd say my attitude towards them have changed slightly. Um, and the good news is, is I've actually been getting questions about bevel up, bevel down planes a little bit more frequently recently, which to me, I interpret to being that there's more new people coming to hand tools, whether they're new to woodworking or just new to woodworking with hand tools. And this question is, is rearing its head again. So we're going to spend some time talking about that. Um, uh, again, I want to say thank you to everybody who supports the show on Patreon. That's what this little banner at the bottom is about. If you do want to like what you see, you want to support the show, patreon.com slash renaissance woodworker. Always, always appreciate it. So um, let's get that out of the way. Uh, chat room is up. Uh, I'd love to take questions. Um, certainly, I'm going to try to stay on topic as much as possible, but I always open it for just basic questions anyway. So. I'll do my best to leave some time for uh, whatever questions that come up. Uh, if you can put them in all caps, it makes my life easier, certainly, uh, since there's nobody moderating it but me. But um, let's start by saying, if you are confused about bevel up and bevel down, first I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of the differences, the physics behind the differences in the way the blades cut. But I urge you not to get too caught up in this debate because honestly, Having worked with a lot of bevel up planes and worked with a lot of bevel down planes, there really is not that much of a difference in performance. And what you're gonna find is your typical out of the box, that's an expression, but you get the idea, your typical bevel up hand plane does not work that much differently than a bevel down hand plane. And in the end, it comes down to a little bit of form and function and ergonomics in some instances, and sometimes just plain old personal preference. I do still believe that a lot of the bevel up planes are a little bit more beginner friendly. There's just less moving parts, right? There's no chip breaker. Um, they give you a lot greater visibility into the cutting action. Um, I shouldn't say a lot greater. You get more visibility into the cutting action just because there's the frogs not in the way. There isn't really that big of a difference in the mass side of things either. Certainly a beveled down plane, because it has uh, the frog in there that holds the blade at a certain angle, has a little bit more mass. But I think the mass thing tends to get overstated more often than not anyway. You can make points for all of this stuff, but the point is you are really splitting hairs when you start saying how one may perform over better over another. So don't get too caught up in that. And we're really gonna talk about those form factors and why you might choose one and over uh, what one may offer that another cannot. So let's, let's get a little close to the workbench here. Spoke shaves, bevel up or down? Yes, you need both. That is a different situation. <laughs> Very good question. Uh, we're talking about hand planes today, and while one can make a case that a spoke shave is kind of a hand plane, uh, you need both. Um, well, you don't need both. If you're going to buy one, buy bevel down, or excuse me, bevel up. Um, the low angle shave is, and these offer um, some really uh, tighter tolerances, and in a lot of ways can act a little bit more like a smoothing plane. You can certainly take smoothing plane style finishing shavings with a bevel up shave, but these to me are workhorses. They do a lot of heavy removal, and these guys I can set up to take much finer removal simply because of the fact that they now have a sole in front of the blade, and you can tighten up that mouth much like you would tighten up the mouth of a smoothing plane. So I tend to think of them as very different tools. If I had to choose one, I would go with a, a bevel up spoke shave because it's just... Um, more flexible. It, it does heavy removal a lot better than some of these bevel, uh, bevel down shapes. So, um, wide variety of planes here. Um, block planes, for the most part, 
are bevel up. Uh, I said this last week. I think that saying a low angle block plane is redundant because block plane by definition should be bevel up plane, but that hasn't stopped anybody, including Stanley, from making a bevel down higher angle block plane. Personally, I think that these should always be uh, bevel up. Here is a bevel up smoothing plane and a bevel up joiner plane. So we kind of got the extremes here from block all the way to a number seven 22 inch joiner plane. And then I've got, again, a number four smoother. I've got my jack plane. Uh, I've got a, a number two, another smoothing plane that I use. And then this is my, my bevel down jointer. I actually don't have a metal bevel down jointer anymore. I ended up selling off my Stanley number seven a while ago. This guy, I'm gonna kind of take out of the discussion because this is a wooden plane. Obviously, it's a very different um, form factor, different in adjusting and using, but it is, and wooden planes are, bevel down plane. So it's important to say that. I bring it out mainly to show that I have both bevel up and bevel down joiners. I use them both. They're pretty much interchangeable. You're not going to find that much difference between them. So I'm going to actually go ahead and move this wooden joiner. That's a joiner plane made by Scott Meek, by the way, in case anybody's curious. Fantastic plane. Love using it. Just kind of a, a different form factor um, than what we're talking about today. So the important thing in recognizing well, obviously, a bevel up plane has the blade. Ooh, I didn't clean that out. There's dust in there. Um, it has the blade set so that the bevel is facing up. Whereas on a bevel down plane, it's flipped over so the bevel is facing down. Let's clean that out. The other primary difference is there is no frog. So what is the frog? Well. So a little plane plane anatomy. The frog is this guy right in here that is separate from the sole of the plane. Move some of this distraction out of the way here. The frog is bolted to the sole of the plane. There are a couple of bolts right here. You can loosen these bolts and actually slide the frog forward and backward. And that is what determines the, the mouth opening on this particular blade. Um, by moving it forward, I get a very, very tight mouth. This frog has moved very far forward, so I've got a very tight mouth here. But again, this blade is, here's the bevel, and that bevel goes down. So the cutting action of this blade is determined by the angle of this frog. And you can buy different frogs. I will tell you right now, I am not a proponent of buying different frogs. I don't like a York pitch frog. This frog is at 45 degrees. This is a standard frog. York pitch goes up to 50 degrees. You can buy 55 degree frogs. I don't find the difference to be that dramatic. Um, and why do you do that? You do that to, to improve uh, tear out results on highly figured woods. I find that a tighter mouth, a sharp blade, and a closely spaced chip breaker will do more than necessarily raising the frog. But there is some merit to raising the cutting angle and we'll get to that in a minute. That's why I have a bevel up smoothing plane. Back to anatomy here. This plane has a frog. It sets the blade at 45 degrees. Unless you're using a, anything other than a standard frog, all bevel down planes present the blade at 45 degrees. The bevel up plane or low angle plane does not have a frog. This bed as part of the sole and this as instead of being 45, it's at a lower 12 degree angle. So when I take this blade and I drop it in, if I were to flip it bevel down, bevel down, now the blade be sole. So I've got a, a 12 degree uh, bed and this is a 25 degree bevel. So now we're, we're raising everything up. What is that, 37 degrees? Math, yeah, 37 degrees. A lot of people will grind a 30 degree angle on here and you'll find 30 degrees is pretty common on a lot of bevel up planes used for everyday work because now you're getting to 42 degrees. So if we're 45 degrees here and with a 30 degree blade, you're at 42 degrees or even 37 degrees, the difference between those two angles is almost negligible. And this is why I go back to what I said at the beginning where it really doesn't make that much of a difference. The standard blade right out of the box, 25 degrees with a 12 degree bed or 25 degrees, again, the bevel angle doesn't really matter on a bevel down. Matters a little bit, but that's a whole other different issue. It has to do with clearance angle, not the cutting action. This setup with the, the standard blade put in, bevel down, 
45 degree cutting angle, 37 degree cutting angle. Yeah, it's, it's, it's eight degrees difference. It really doesn't make that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. And I urge people to not get too caught up in that because you're not going to um, set up, well, let's just go smoother to smoother here. Um, you're not gonna set these two planes up and go, oh my God, this one cuts totally differently. This one produced totally different results over the other because of a cutting angle. You may find different results personally just based upon how you use it. Personally, I prefer a bevel down plane. This is where I've kind of, for lack of a better term, matured to over the years. I like the to be able to point my index finger, rest it along the blade. I like that my middle finger rests right here on the adjuster wheel. So I can very quickly make adjustments on the fly without changing my grip. I, I just like how the whole plane feels. This plane, technically I can still point my index finger and rest it on the side, but it, it's not quite as comfortable. I can't really with this finger, my middle finger, adjust this wheel. And some of that is the, the Norris style adjuster as compared to the Bailey style adjuster back here. But these planes tend to be a little bit tighter on the adjustment. So I find that I have to just kind of stop and I usually adjust with my other hand. So it's not quite adjust on the fly. But more than anything, what you find with a lot of these bevel up planes is the handle itself is tilted up a little bit more. Now, Veritas, this is a Lee Valley Veritas plane. They have a much more upright handle profile than, than, than Lee Nielsen and then typical Stanley patterns or you know, here's a, an original Stanley pattern. But even on their uh, on the Stanley low angle planes and on the Lee Nielsen low angle planes, you find that everything is a little bit more upright. There's more openness in here. And I just kind of don't like that anymore. That's a personal feel for me. I like the more compact nature, um, the way that my hand fits in here nicely. This index finger particularly is very important for me. I don't know, it's lots of sawing, I guess, but I just find that it's more comfortable. I've got better connection to the tool. I'm kind of more locked in using this style of plane than I am with this style of plane. That is a very personal thing. And you may feel just the opposite and you may want to try several, but, this plane, and there's a reason that I've got this plane floating around, because this is my tear-out specialist. This is my nuclear option. I can handle a lot of tear-out with this Lee Nielsen number four. Um, I can handle a lot of tear-out with this vintage Stanley number two. For that matter, I can handle a hell of a lot of tear-out with this Wood River number three. I have a lot of different smoothing planes because the Different sizes allow me to do different things and tackle different boards. And the shorter the sole, you know, the, the more I can ride in the hills and valleys. And I like having different options for smoothing over different types of topography. But when these guys just, no matter what I do, can't resolve a torn out surface, sometimes I'll grab a scraper, but a lot of times I go to this plane. And this is really the, the primary advantage of a bevel up plane is because of the fact that the bevel angle determines the cutting angle. If I increase this bevel, I'm increasing the, the presentation angle. So the same reason that you would put rises up, it will break on that 45 degree angle. We also have a chip breaker on the back of a blade that can actually steepen that angle. When you raise this up even higher, you're breaking that chip a lot faster. You're forcing that wood up and breaking back a lot faster. And that what that does is prevent the fibers, that grain from running out, from lifting out in front of the blade. And that's really what tarot is. But this is also why having a sole in front of the blade and being able to tighten that mouth either by adjusting the sole itself or by moving the frog back and forth, that provides support in front of the cutting action that prevents those fibers from lifting up and away. But now the added higher angle is causing that chip to curl, to break back on itself. And when it does curl, when it breaks, it loses the force that it's exerting out in front. So if you were to, to, to grab, actually let me grab a little stick here thin piece of wood. Let's knock a bunch of stuff over first. So I've got a board here that, this will be 
one giant honking shaving. But as this blade comes in and it starts to lift the fibers, you see how that fiber is lifting up. Well, as I continue to push, you see how that fiber is lifting way up and it's, it's I'm touching back here, but it's lifting up and, and wanting to tear out. I've got this long lever here that can exert a great deal of force further downstream, further down the board. And as that lifts out and tears, that's calling, causing tear out. What you're actually doing is splitting the wood. And if you've ever split a wood with a, you know, an ax splitting firewood or riven parts for chairs or something, you see the surface is not you know, perfectly smooth. It's got that firewood split look to it. That is what tear out is. Well, if I am forcing the shaving, as I lift up the shaving, as it comes out straight like this, it's creating a lot of lever force downstream to lift that fiber out. But the minute that shaving curls, it breaks and it doesn't, it dramatically reduces the force that's exerted further down the board. So you can imagine if I keep lifting on this board and I put my finger right here, so it's acting like a fulcrum. If I continue to lift here, eventually it's going to break right here. But up until the point that it breaks, there is a lot of force being exerted over on this side of my finger. The minute it breaks at my finger, the force over here drops to zero. And that's what's happening. That fiber is actually breaking and it's preventing tear out by curling that chip back. So back to the bevel up plane, a lot of physics we're talking about here. But the bevel up plane now, instead of it being presented at that 45 degree angle all the time, when I flip it over, I'm presented at 12 degrees plus the bevel angle. Well, this blade has a um, 50 degree angle on it. It's ground very, very steep. So now I'm actually my cutting angle, when I put it in place here, my actual resultant cutting angle is 62 degrees. This is 45, now I'm almost 20 degrees higher, and that does make a difference. There's a significant enough difference in those presentation angles that this just, it doesn't create tear out. There's just, it's, I've never been able to create tear out. No matter what I do, I can open the mouth up super wide on this, and it still doesn't create tear out. Because now we're really moving very close to a card scraper. You know, as I am scraping wood, I usually start at about 90 degrees and I start to lean over a little bit and I usually am rolling my burr so that it's cutting right about, and this burr is starting to cut right about there. Well, this angle, I don't know what that angle is, but that's probably about 70 degrees maybe, maybe 75 degrees. So we're getting really close to that 60 degree angle. Add to that 60 degree angle the fact that I now have support in front of the cutting action in the shape of this sole and I can tighten up that mouth so that I'm getting full support right up into the cutting action, this becomes what I like to call a polishing plane. This is not a smoothing plane anymore, Frog. I could put a 55 degree angle in this, in this plane and it would do something close, but really to get all the way up into the 60 degree presentation angle, you need to have a bevel up plane. You need to be able to manip manipulate that. Now, the downside to that is this is a little bit harder to push. This blade uh, presentation angle being so high, you imagine you know, lifting up a shaving by pushing at a low angle like this is much easier than trying to lift a shaving like that. So th there is more force, a little bit more work required in order to get this guy to uh, curl up a shaving. The edge is super durable because I've got so much steel. With that steep angle, I've got a very thick amount of steel at the edge. But because I'm presenting it at such a high angle, a lot of times the blade will dull a little bit faster. So it's kind of a um, uh, kind of a paradox. Even though the blade is durable because I've got a lot of steel backing it up, it's actually less durable because of this high, almost scraping angle at which I'm presenting it. This blade will stay sharp a lot longer because it's cutting at a slightly lower angle. Now we go to the flip side of that and really why block planes, why most people think of block planes is working on ingrain. This block plane, 25 degree angle, 12 degree bed. So again, we're working at that 37 degree angle. As we get lower, just use a chisel. And here is my demonstration chisel for my timber framing uh, toolkit here. 
if I wanted to pull up a shaving, I could pull up a shaving at a higher angle. But if I drop this down, it's gonna be a heck of a lot easier to create a shaving. And this is really what this guy is used for. This big chisel is used for uh, paring tendon cheeks and things like that. This isn't a slick, but it's just a little bit smaller than a slick. With this large back as a reference tool, it's real easy. In fact, I've got a bit of glue here. It's real easy to come in and just peel that away because I'm at a very, very low angle. Same reason that there are switchbacks on hills to make it easier to go up the hill. If you've got a super steep hill, you can either go straight up it, and that's a you know incredible grade to climb, or you can switch back up it. And by going on a switchback, you're lowering the angle and making it easier to do the work. So the low angle can have a great advantage when you're working on really tough stuff like ingrain. The problem with low angle on face grain is you can get in there low angle and you will have a tendency to want to lift out that chip. This action we were talking about before, as that blade goes under there, it really easy cuts under there, but it also will lift out a long fiber. And if you're working with a particularly uh, stringy straight grain species like Douglas fir or something, it will lift out down the entire length of the board if you were trying to plane it with a low angle blade. But where this becomes really beneficial is in planing ingrain. Because ingrain, the straws are running, the fibers, the straws that make up the wood are running out this direction. So they're not going, you're not going to get up underneath it and lift it out like you would on the face. You're cutting right across the end there. It's really tough to do, so you want to lower that blade angle in order to make that cutting a lot easier. That, that's the theory, the principle, if you will, the physics behind low angle and why they even exist. So that being said, we recognize that having low angle for ingrain is great. Doesn't mean that you can't use a standard angle plane to do ingrain. In fact, I actually find that that's where mass becomes a bigger issue. If I've got a board like this and I'm doing ingrain work on, I need to polish this ingrain, this little block plane is great for that because it's a pretty small edge. But if I wanted to uh, plane the ingrain of say a tabletop that's 36 inches wide, using this little plane pretty much sucks for that. That's where I can use a jack plane. And I don't have a low angle jack in my shop right now. I have a, a low angle jack that lives in my northern toolkit at my in-laws place up in Maine. I put it up there and that's where it lives. Actually, that's not true. I do have a low angle jack now from a, a different source, but regardless, I would much rather use this plane because of the greater mass for the ingrain, despite the fact that it's a standard angle um, uh, presentation. So ingrain is great, or excuse me, low angle is great for ingrain, but it doesn't have to be. Also doesn't mean that you can't use a low angle plane on stuff other than ingrain. But most places when they sell a low angle jack, and this is that low angle jack I keep forgetting that I have. <sighs> Boy, I've got to do some dusting in here. A lot of times manufacturers, you go to Veritas, you go to Lee Nielsen, even Wood River, and you buy a low angle jack plane now, you can even buy a kit where it comes with multiple blades and you get a 25 degree angle blade and a 30 degree angle blade and a 50 degree angle blade and a tooth blade and a 90 degree angle blade. Um, all of that can be beneficial for flexibility. I can take this single plane and I can swap a, a higher angle blade to use as more of a smoother a polishing plane. I can swap in um, a curved blade and suddenly I've got the same functionality as my, my four plane or my scrub plane. Or you can swap in something like a tooth blade and do some work there. And I'll talk about that in a minute because I had um, one of the um, uh, um, patrons ask me that question. So um, stick a pin in that. We'll talk about tooth blades and a low angle in a second. So the ability to swap blades in and out and change the function of that plane is really the marketing hype. That's what, I shouldn't say hype because that sounds like it doesn't, it's not true. That's the marketing tagline, if you will. That's why it's great to have low angle planes. And it's why I think as a beginner, a low angle plane is a good place to start. Again, you don't have to worry about adjusting the chip breaker and setting the chip breaker X distance from the edge of the blade based upon the type of work you do because there's no chip breaker in a low angle plane. You can have a couple of blades and you can dedicate a couple of blades to certain things. I usually recommend, in fact, I've got a beginning toolkit listed on my website where I say start with a low angle jack, get an extra blade and grind uh, a 10 inch or nine inch radius camber on it 
and use that as your foreplane. And then use the straight blade for jointing work, possibly smoothing work. You also could take, um, just last week, we talked about plane tracks. You could get a third blade and grind that really, really subtle smoothing plane camber I talked about last week and put that in here. So with one plane, you can have smoothing functionality, you could have rough four plane functionality, then you could have just run of the mill joiner plane type functionality without having to do a lot of setup other than just swapping out the blade. And that, that's, that's a really key thing when you only have one plane in your arsenal. Which is why, again, good for beginners. Over time, you'll start to acquire more planes. You know, certainly there are limitations to a jack plane. At some point, you are going to want something longer when you're dealing with longer parts and you need more, um, more plane sole for flatter surfaces then yeah, a joiner plane can be beneficial. You'll find that the longer sole of a jack plane becomes a limitation when you start smoothing. You're gonna want something a little bit smaller. So you will start to acquire more planes and that's exactly what happened with me. I started very much on a low angle side of things. Um, really when I started working with hand tools, um, hand tools had really started to, to experience uh, another renaissance. <laughs> How many have they had now? Like six or seven renaissance? Um, but it was, they were becoming really, really popular again. And companies like Veritas were just coming onto the scene and putting out these really cool planes. And I definitely, you know, hook, line and sinker went with the marketing and saw all the different ways that I could switch out these blades. Well, then I started acquiring more planes and me personally discovered that form factor that I like of the bevel down plane. Really what it took was, was um, working in a living history museum where there was nothing but, um, you know, vintage Stanleys and wooden planes that really moved me over to the bevel down side of things. Today, I can pick up one or the other, and you know, assuming that the blade is sharp and the blade the plane is tuned well, it performs exactly the same. For me, it just comes down to the feel of it. So, if you're brand new to this, I still recommend low angle, as I said, but just be prepared for the fact that as you start to add more planes try out some bevel down planes and see what you think. You may find that you like the form factor of low angle, um, or you may be like me and find that you like the bevel down approach. Care and maintenance is exactly the same. When it comes to the, the bevel, and, and this goes to uh, another question from one of my patrons, um, we we're talking about how there's really very little difference because once you have the bed angle plus the, ba the blade angle plus any secondary angle or tertiary angle, you're, you're coming up, you're stepping up higher and higher to the point where you're pretty much equal to that 45. I don't believe in secondary or tertiary angles. I used to put secondary or micro bevels on my blade, put a micro bevel on my plane, then I would go back and essentially erase it by um, sharpening or honing at the primary angle, you know, and it took couple of seconds to erase that micro bevel. Notice I'm saying micro bevel, not secondary bevel. It's tiny, tiny, tiny micro bevel. So you erase that micro bevel and then you just raise up a little bit and add it back. And I was like, why am I doing this? If I'm erasing it at the primary bevel angle, why don't I just stick at the primary bevel angle? It just, to me, it's, it's an added level of complication to add secondary bevels, especially tertiary bevels. The only reason for a secondary bevel, in my opinion, is on a mortising chisel. We can talk about that another day. That's a durability and access issue. For hand planes, I don't see the point. To me, it's adding another step. What, it, what the idea is, is by lifting it up and adding a micro bevel, it makes it quicker to sharpen because you're not sharpening the entire bevel. You're just sharpening that little tip. What it ends up being is a crutch. People lift up at that higher angle and they can get that burr to come up because they're, they're working at a higher angle. If you work at the primary angle and you work right up to the edge, you're gonna get a burr. And if you're not getting a burr at that primary angle, you're doing something a little bit weird. Something, something is not quite right with, you. sorry, my phone's buzzing. I had to shut it up. Something's not quite right with your sharpening technique and you need to investigate that you know, rather than find a shortcut around it. Again, this may be a personal thing. I find that, that the whole idea of secondary bevels becomes too much additional work. But the point, the original point being, as you add secondary bevels, you need to add that into the equation. 12 degrees plus whatever your primary angle is plus whatever your secondary angle is. And now you're at 45 degrees really, really quickly. And here again, there's really very little difference between the two, the two um, planes. That being said, <laughs> I know that I've probably got a bunch of uh, questions in here. Um, 
you put a curve and a bevel up, how? Uh, go back last week to uh, my uh, plane track video and how I added the curve on that plane is exactly how I do it in bevel up. There is no difference, no difference. A lot of people will make the case that a bevel up plane needs a slightly wider camber, slightly larger radius camber. When you're talking about a smoothing plane camber, the camber is already so wide, so slight, that it doesn't, doesn't make a difference. Last week, watch last week's video on eliminating plane tracks, that's how I do it. And the trial and error that comes with how many strokes you take on each corner based on how wide of a cut you want is gonna be different from one plane to the next. So whether it's bevel up or bevel down does not make a difference. You add that curve the exact same way. Um, is there a vintage low angle plane? Absolutely. The Stanley number 62 is this. This is a modern, this is made by Tay Tools. Veritas has one, Lee Nielsen has one, but Stanley did it first. Um, the original block plane is a low angle tool. So low angle tools are not a modern invention. There's really nothing new in woodworking. Maybe the domino, <laughs> nothing is new. You know, th th these things have been around for a very, very long time. So absolutely there are vintage versions and they are expensive. Let me tell you, they can be difficult to find and they are expensive. Um, I got a question here from Frank. Um, uh, oh, okay. Um, Frank, I will get to you in just a second because I want to spend some time on that. But um, Mirko says, uh, would you recommend a fine adjusting apparatus for a bevel up joiner? No. I don't even know what you mean by fine adjusting apparatus, like a mallet? Um, no, I don't know. I mean, if you've got a bevel up joiner, this is a Veritas bevel up joiner. The fine adjustment is the adjustment wheel and the, uh, the Nora style adjuster here. That's all you need. The one thing I will say um, again about bevel ups, if I were to buy a joiner plane again, I would probably buy a bevel down. Um, I again bought this early in my woodworking career when I was all enamored by bevel up planes. It served me well, but now it basically functions exactly the same as my bevel down joiner. It functions exactly the same as the old number seven that I have since sold off. Um, I don't find there's really very much difference between the two of them. I do, however, like, in this case, I do like the little bit lower profile when I'm doing match joining, um, edge joining to form panel joints. I kind of like that it's a lower sense of gravity and it gives me a little bit better feel for edge jointing, if, if I'm square to the board or not. Um, that is more than likely just what I'm used to than it being any, than it actually being a real thing. Um, but this is a key point. I have a bevel, buy a beveled on joiner plane when I've got a bevel up one that works perfectly fine. But here again, this is a perfect illustration of why there's really not that much difference between the two of them comes down to form factor more than anything else. Um, I do want to talk real quickly about uh, toothing blades uh, because, well, to be honest, that was asked by a patron of the show and well, yeah, <laughs> you do the, you do the math. Um, tooth blades, there are two kinds of tooth blades and I have done a couple of videos in the past about toothing planes. These guys, vintage toothing planes versus toothed irons that are marketed by guys like Lee Nielsen and Veritas. So, um, you can certainly look in my, my channel, just search for toothing or toothed and you'll find, I think three or four different videos on this topic, but we'll just quickly revisit it now. Um, the question was, I've, ex uh, you know, I think I've expressed a not so favorable opinion of the modern tooth blades. And that's not exactly true. The modern tooth blades are fine. I actually have one. I just got to find it. <laughs> you can tell you how much I use it. There it is. Oh, and by the way, I have extra blades for my Veritas smoother. They are right here. I've got a 25 degree and a 38 degree. I never use them anymore. <laughs> this, this goes back to when I first bought the plane. I needed to have all this extra stuff. This plane has become relegated to a 50 degree polishing plane. So here is a, this is a Veritas toothing blade, but you're going to find that the um, uh, Lee Nielsen one looks very much the same. Let's make some room here so we can show this off. So zoom, zoom, zoom. And 
here's the vintage. So right off the bat, you can look at this and barely see the teeth on the vintage plane. And this one, the teeth are much more pronounced. But there's a shape difference. And maybe we can zoom in a little bit more, maybe, without it losing focus. Um, this tooth, they're like individual fingers that stick out. So here's a tooth, here's a tooth, and then there's kind of a square cutout in between them. This tooth looks exactly like saw teeth. So there is a flat face and an angled face, just like you would find in any old saw tooth. It looks like that, in other words. Um, zero rake angle on, on the, the face. It's a very different style of tooth, but it's also a very, very fine tooth. I don't think you would refer to toothing blades in terms of pitch, but if I were to look at this like a saw and count teeth per inch, we're talking like 22 teeth per inch. It's very, very fine. And they do produce different types of cuts. The toothing blade, or toothing plane rather, traditionally was, well, used for a variety of stuff. But a lot of times, most people think of it as a veneering tool. Um, you can tooth the surface of a veneer and tooth the surface of a substrate to uh, provide tooth. <laughs> what do we mean by that? The mechanical property of having a little bit of tooth to something means that you've got some grip. And you can take a veneer that's been grooved with a toothing blade and the substrate, and they will kind of lock together. Those teeth will interlock, and they give you more glue surface, but also a tactile mechanical joint between those two surfaces. And the idea being you can, you can tooth two surfaces and get a much longer lasting veneer bond. With modern veneer glues and the advent of things like vacuum presses, I don't know really how important that is. Modern veneer glues and a vacuum press give you a bond that is stronger than nature ever intended. Um, do I still tooth some of my surfaces? When I hammer veneer, I absolutely do. I find that I can get just that, that little bit of extra friction, if you will, from a tooth surface does a great job. Now I don't tooth my veneers because, well, if I'm using commercial veneers, because if you try to tooth a commercial veneer, you're gonna tear it all to hell. A shop sawn, and when these planes were in use, veneers were all shop sawn, they were much thicker. You can tooth a thicker veneer um, and get really, really strong bond between the two of them. They kind of lock in place. You can very quickly kind of level a surface when you don't really care about how the surface looks, the toothing plane doesn't pay attention to grain direction. Because it's not presenting a cutting edge, one uniform cutting edge, but tiny little cutting edges, it doesn't really cause tear out because the cutting surface is so small and independent of one another. And the area between the tooth that is not cutting actually kind of holds the wood together and keeps it from tearing out. So the upshot to that is, is the toothing plane works in any direction, across the grain, with the grain, against the grain, whatever, and it can quickly level out a small surface and get you, um, get you flat-ish or get you into a section where you could do layout of joinery or just clear some stuff out of the way. And you will find long ago, the Anthony Hay shop in Williamsburg has a blog post they did on toothing planes and evidence of tooth plane marks in old furniture. And you see that this plane was used a lot for just kind of quickly removing some material. Um, but it is a fine removal tool. The issue that I take with the modern blades is the larger teeth are not really that fine. Now you can retract the blade into the sole and take like you would a smoothing plane and take a finer shaving and you're still getting that same idea where it's not one cutting edge, but a lot of little cutting edges. And it will allow you to kind of work across the grain with the grain against the grain. That same thing functions there. But the way I'm seeing it marketed now, and I'm not gonna deny that this does work, but it's being marketed as a heavy removal tool in figured woods. So a quick way, if, you, if you've got a rough sawn, say, tiger maple board, and trying to remove the rough sawn marks is creating a huge amount of tear out, you grab your toothing plane and you scrub off essentially the rough sawn surface, but the little teeth don't create tear out. I have an issue with that because I can, I can be more efficient in rough removal with a well-sharpened four-plane iron or scrub-plane iron any day than one of these guys. So does it work? Yes, but I disagree with the fact that it's an efficient way to go from a rough sawn board to a flat-ish board. I just don't think that you can beat 
uh, a cambered iron like you can with one of these guys. Now, I don't work with a lot of real crazy exotics. I shouldn't say that. I work with teak a fair bit, but I don't work with a lot of the really nasty jungle woods, the cocobolos and grenadillos and, and um, you know, the, the, the really, really figured woods as well. The, the heavily figured woods that I do work with are mostly domestic species that are gonna be a little bit easier on hand planes anyway. And I do find that um, using my four plane does just fine. It may generate a little bit of tear out, but nothing so severe that I can't plane it out later using my number four. So can you use a modern tooth iron the way a vintage tooth iron was used for actually keying or toothing a surface? You can, but the grooves are so much larger. Orders of magnitude, I would say, just, just comparing these two, the tooth size on this vintage plane is easily a quarter that of the tooth size on this modern plane. So the, the grooves, the teeth that this blade creates are much, much larger. And where you will find if you're keying veneer surfaces, you can actually have a hard time actually laying the veneer where you want it because the teeth are so big that will actually lock together and kind of shift the veneer one side to the other because there's large heavy grooves in here. It, it's nearly impossible to tooth a veneer because the grooves are so big. The sawtooth action to me cuts a lot better, a lot sweeter, a lot smoother across the grain and against the grain than this guy ever does because here again, we are presenting a square edge tooth to the wood and it will tear out if working against the grain. But the tear out is so small because the tooth is so small that you're not really seeing it as the traditional, what you would expect to see in tear out, but it's still tearing. The sawtooth action is presenting a point to the wood and a gradually widening shape to it because you're presenting a triangle, not you know, a square tooth to it. So it's a very different cutting action, more like a saw um, and a knife edged saw than a chisel like we have here. So it is a different physical physical action than, um, than what you would get from the modern tooth blade. And I just find that the vintage guys outperform without question the modern tooth irons. And I really don't see the point of using a modern tooth iron for rough removal and flattening of a board. Maybe I just haven't met my reference thing, but I just, I, I don't buy into the way the tooth blade is marketed today. Um, just doesn't, doesn't have a place in my work. So let's go back and answer some questions here. Um, so Frank says, please help me. <laughs> I dropped my new chip breaker on the concrete floor and guess where it landed? I waited two months to get it, huh? How can I help you there? Um, so if the chip breaker is dented, you can sharpen a chip breaker or you can hone a chip breaker like you can a blade and you can grind out any dings in that chip breaker. The problem will be if the chip breaker registers some of the planes, and, and this is a Lee Nielsen blade, Veritas blades don't do this, but I found some of the off-brand vintage guys. Um, actually, the chip breaker registers in a little notch and there's only so far you can move it up and down the blade. That's a rarity, but for the most part, if this chip breaker, I were to drop this on the concrete floor and it dinged it up, I could take this chip breaker and I could grind it back beyond that and get that smooth edge again and just be a matter of sliding the chip breaker down to fix that. So um, it's not the end of the world. It may require some additional uh, grinding on your behalf. If you don't have a grinder, it could be long, long work on a stone or sandpaper, but it is certainly possible to grind a chip breaker. I don't actually know how chip breakers, I don't know much about the metallurgy of chip breakers. Are they hardened like you know an O1 or A2 or PMV11 blade? I don't think they are but I could be totally wrong there. Um, the point being, if it's not, it's, I'm sure it's hardened and tempered to some level, but it's probably not to the same hardness of the tool steel. And you may actually find that grinding it back may be a lot easier because the steel may be softer. But I'm talking out my butt at this point. I could be totally wrong. If anybody in the chat room, anybody watching this in the future knows better, feel free to correct me because I, I just don't know. But just be a matter of grinding it back. It is important that your chip breaker mate against the blade cleanly that there be no dings, there be no gaps, 
and there'd be a solid mate there because any tiny little gap or even a burr over the surface is a place for a shaving to grab and it will cause a plane to clog. So you really wanna fix that. The other thing is presenting the chip breaker, the angle on the front of the chip breaker should be a consistent angle because as, what, what does the chip breaker do? It breaks chips, right? As that shaving, this is my, my proto shaving here. As that shaving rides up the blade, it's riding up at a certain angle, whatever the presentation angle is, standard blade or bevel down, it's 45, whatever the blade angle on your bevel up, that presentation angle, the shaving's riding up there. Well, then it hits the chip breaker, which is at an even steeper angle to that, and it curls up even more, and it causes that chip to break. That's why one of the ways you can control tear out is by moving the chip breaker edge closer to the cutting edge because you're forcing that chip to break even faster. A lot of vintage irons don't have a bevel angle on them. This Lee Nielsen has a flat chip breaker. Where's my number two? Oh, I put it away. Um, it has a flat chip breaker that mates perfectly against the blade. So... This is the Lee Nielsen. So the chip breaker itself almost looks like another blade. I mean, the blade is, is longer than the chip breaker and that's really the only way you can tell the difference because they look almost exactly the same. There is a tiny little gap that's created in between them just behind the leading edge of the chip breaker. And what that ensures, that little gap ensures that this leading edge of the chip breaker always comes up tight to the back of the blade. Vintage irons like this Stanley do the same thing, but they're more pronounced. They have this curvature to them. So there's really not a, a necessarily an angle ground here, but a convexity that very quickly causes that chip to ride up and break over that little hump. Um, a lot of these, this one has a little bit of a bevel ground on it because it wasn't flat when I got it. And I had to grind this flat so that it was presenting a, a consistent edge to the back of the blade. But this is what you see in a lot of vintage blades. It's got that convexity that causes that chip to break. Um, if this is the blade chip break that you're talking about, and it has broken and you grind it, obviously the more you grind it, the further you go back into this convexity and that could cause some problems with it mating um, to the, the wood. But there's a fair amount of spring to this. This screw is tightened down. If I un, well, not if, let me just show you. If I loosen this, you'll see that the gap opens up quite a bit. So. There is a fair amount of spring action as I tighten this down, I'm closing up that gap a long way. So if I have to grind more of this leading edge back, all that's doing is just, it, you've got room to play with. If you've got to grind a hell of a lot back, then that's a problem and you need to get a new chip breaker, um, which is possible. Um, even if you have a brand new plane like this, you can actually order chip breakers alone. Um, Ron Hawk sells them, Lee Nielsen sells them, Veritas sells them. You can buy new chip breakers. Um, if that chip breaker that you broke is in something like a Veritas or Lee Nielsen, I would even call them because they might even replace it for you for free. Maybe, maybe they'll charge you a little bit for it, but their, their customer service departments are, are pretty good in that respect. So, Uh, good point. Richard says, for me, bevel down equals consistency. I agree with that. I do agree that there is some consistency there um, from one plane to the other. And it's probably why I've ended up um, gravitating towards them. Oh, okay. Um, this is back to Mirko's question about fine adjustment. There is some replacement part for the Veritas joiner with a finer thread on the screw. I don't think it's necessary. I've never needed it. And I've been using this Veritas joiner for 10 years. So um, can't imagine why. Will a number four cap iron work on a four and a half or do I have to find the correct size? Um, yeah, it'll work. Um, I would recommend you find a correct size because you're gonna get, if the cap iron is gonna be pressing down uh, more uniformly across the blade. Whereas with the narrower cap iron of a four and of a wider four and a half, you're gonna have a little bit of space on either side. If you have a number four cap iron already, use it and see what happens. Um, I, I don't personally have experience with that to tell you if it's that big of a deal. Um, 
What's the blade size difference with a four and a half? Quarter inch? Three eighths of an inch? I don't think it's that much. So divide that by two, three sixteenths or an eighth of an inch, and that's how much blade is unsupported on either side of the cap iron. And I don't know that it would make that big of a difference. I say if you have the number four cap iron, go with it. And if you are finding that you're having problems, then you may have to go with a four and a half, but I, I just don't see why it wouldn't work. You might be a clog point possibly, um, but even then, if your shavings are running all the way up to the cap iron, um, you need to readjust your chip breaker. The chip breaker should be breaking the shaving well before it gets to the cap iron. So a clog point around the cap iron should be What happened to your Lee Nielsen number three? I never had a Lee Nielsen number three. I have a Wood River number three, and that is, where'd it go? Oh, right here. Still use it today. It's just another one of my smoothing planes. A close-up of the screwdriver ferrule. Okay. That's an odd question, Sean. It's purdy. That's what it is. This is an Elkhead Tools screwdriver. So it's a uh, focus. There you go. There you go. Very cool, huh? Nice curvature to it. And this cool flare part that runs back in the handle. Yeah. These are cool screwdrivers, but wee bit pricey. Just a wee bit pricey. Um, okay, Frank says it was a Wood River cap iron. Um, Pretty sure, I mean, these Chinese made planes are pretty much Lee Nielsen planes. Um, in fact, that's been a real bone of contention with uh, Thomas Lee Nielsen. <laughs> he would never say that because that's just the kind of guy he is. But um, yeah, I mean, this is the same setup. So this is going to be even easier to fix. You can just grind it back at that same angle um, and it will it will fix the problem relatively easily. You're going to shorten, you know, the chip breaker a little bit, but that's not really going to cause any issues over the long haul. Have I ever used a transition plane? Uh, seems like an excellent compromise. Um, <laughs> uh, Jeffrey, let me burst your bubble a little bit there. Um, uh, transition planes are not worth the effort. <laughs> Sorry about that, Sean. I just used your channel name in a very derogatory way. Transition planes are definitely not worth the effort. They, um, the most that I would ever use one for would be as a four plane, a heavy removal type plane. Because the, um, obviously with a wooden sole, you're going to have seasonal adjustments that need to happen there. But when you fix the non-seasonal moving mechanism on top of the wooden sole, it's, you've got an immobile section and a mobile section, and it just, they came to be really a pain in the butt to, um, to keep in line. Um, and they're not, they're really only good for rough removal. And even then, if I'm gonna use a wooden plane for rough removal, I'm gonna use a wooden plane, not a transition plane. So coming over to my timber frame toolkit, I have a jack plane a wooden jack plane specifically because when I'm doing timber frame or green woodworking stuff, I'm working with green wood. So it's very wet. If I use this jack plane, the sucker will rust because the, the wood is so wet. Even if you, you know, wipe it down and oil it at the end of every day, it's already going to have rust on it, especially where I live where the humidity is really high. So I have a wooden plane specifically to prevent rust. Um, certainly the iron can still rust, but at least the, all of this stuff I don't have to worry about. Transition planes, um, I personally think they make great firewood. It just, yeah, just wasn't a good idea. Um, and the fact that you can find so many of them and so many of them in really bad disrepair shows you kind of how little people cared about them and also how well they do not stand up to the test of time. So yeah, not, not, a, not a fan. Um, combination planes, Sure, they're fine. I've actually talked about them on this channel before in a live session a couple of years ago. Um, I have had several of them over the years. They don't factor really well into my work. I don't really find them 
to be all that beneficial. Um, and if I were to buy one today, I would pony up for the Veritas one because there's so many little issues and oftentimes missing parts with the vintage guys. Um, and from my experience in working at shows and things with the Veritas one, it's just, it's a, it's a better put together plane. The fence works better. Um, all of the parts interchange a lot better. Um, the twin skate functions a little better than the vintage Stanley's, but they are not nearly, they're glorified plow planes, really. And when you find most people will have the, the 45s or the 55s, they use them as plow planes primarily, and rarely do they use them as beading or reading tools. Um, not all that much for rabbiting tools. Um, you're not gonna cut better rabbits than you would with a dedicated rabbit plane. So just as anything, when you've got a utility plane or a combination plane, it's kind of good at a lot of things, but not really good at one thing. And that's really the sacrifice you run into. So rather than me having one plane, um, I would rather have a couple of rabbit planes and a plow plane. And in most instances, um, especially with modern versions like the Veritas, it's gonna be cheaper <laughs> to have a couple of these guys and even a Veritas plow plane would still be cheaper in the long run. So um, maybe it's a personal thing. I just don't really see the point of the combo plane. Um, in the, the years I've been hand tool woodworking, I just haven't really run into a situation where this would be perfect for a combo plane. What about a Norris adjuster in wood planes? Um, no, I, I do not agree with it. When you start adding the, for lack of a better term, precision of a Norris or Bailey style adjuster into the lack of precision caused by a wooden sole, the two don't mix. And it's silly. There's not a strong enough reason. Let's phrase it this way. And yes, I do use Krenoff style planes. That's what under my tool cabinet, I have three Krenoff style planes and I do use them. Um, they have a slightly different feel being a wooden sole. Sometimes I use them just because I like that feel. Sometimes I use them on certain species. They work a little bit better, but uh, I also have them because uh, I'm good friends with Scott Meek and I wanted to support him over the years. Um, the Norris style adjuster or the Bailey style adjuster on a wooden sole, AKA a combination plane, is so much more complex than a blade and a wedge. And if you're working with wooden planes and you're having trouble dealing with the whole idea of adjusting a wedge and using a plane mallet to do your adjustments, then buy a metal plane. Um, because the metal plane is gonna give you that ability to have more fine adjustments. If you really struggle with the ability to adjust one of these guys, don't use a wooden plane. Um, the added advantage of fine adjustment with a mechanism stuck on a wooden sole, it's, it's a paradox that does not work. Um, I, and it, to me, they don't work, they don't work any better. In fact, they work a lot worse than a plain old wooden plane. This wooden jack plane works so much better than any transition plane. So I just don't see the point of mixing the two. I'm beaten up on Jeffrey today. <laughs> He's going to be bruised. Um, did I miss any questions further up here? I don't think so. I don't think so. So um, that's my two cents on bevel up planes. I went, uh, the video I did a while ago basically said kind of what I said today, bevel up planes are kind of good for beginners and there are solid reasons for that. The utility of a bevel up plane is a nice thing to have. Um, but in the end, I do find that the more you work with hand tools, the more you tend to gravitate towards the bevel down for the form factor. Um, and I do agree, um, whoever it was that said that in the chat room, there is a level of consistency, I think, that comes from the bevel down planes that I don't get from bevel up. So is that my opinion? Absolutely. Is it my opinion born on a lot of experience using both? Absolutely. Um, so for me, uh, if I continue to buy planes, which I can't imagine why I would need to buy a plane at this point, um, it would be a bevel down plane. That's the problem with plane manufacturers today. They make such great planes that there's really no reason why I would ever need to buy a plane. Unless somebody's gonna invent something super fancy that's totally changes the world, there's really no reason for me to buy another plane. Um, and that's why I get in trouble by buying planes that I don't need because I just think they're cool. <laughs> it's a good position to be in right now. So, um, 
has anyone tried that adjuster Veritas makes for wooden planes? Uh, I know a couple of people who've tried it. Um, I don't know anybody that's really said, oh, it's such a game changer. Um, I guess the difference being is you can make your own planes a little bit easier by taking a block of wood and slapping that adjuster on top of it. But I don't think making planes, I should shut up. I don't really make a lot of planes, but I have made some and it wasn't like it was that difficult. So I don't know. All right, folks. Well, then I think I will call it a night. I do appreciate everybody coming out. Love talking about planes almost as much as I love talking about saws. Saws are more fun. But um, I will see when I put this post together uh, and put it up on the Renaissance Woodworker site. Um, let me see if I can dig up some links to the other, uh, that combo plane that I talked about. Uh, certainly the other times I've talked about bevel up planes. I'd be curious to see how much I contradict myself <laughs> from four or five, seven years ago. So very cool folks, always a pleasure. And um, have a good night.